My guest today is Jim Molinari, head men's basketball coach. How you doing, coach? Gordy, how are you doing? Very fine. Big week, recruiting time, huh? Big week. So. I want to say one thing coming in, Gordy. Thanks for having me on. And people don't know the history of this, but I always told you, you have written me notes to encourage me over my first four years. But I told you I didn't want to do the show until we accomplished something. So That's thankfully, right. we finally accomplished something this year so we can do the show. You're absolutely correct, Coach. I remember that very clearly that we talked about it. And I said, come on. And you said, no, no, no. I got to have something to talk about. And we got stuff to talk about. What was the record this year? Uh, 18 and 15, which is, which is great. I mean, it was the most wins for a long time. But, you know, people don't remember how you start. You always got to prepare with the end in mind. I think it's how we finished. Uh, 9 and 20, uh, first year. What you, would you think? Ouch. Um, I think that Dr. Van Alstein didn't tell me everything in the interview. <laughs> That's what I thought. But... Uh, but after that, you know, I mean, I've been a part of three rebuilding projects, Northern Illinois, uh, Bradley, and now here. And so you, you expect that. The, the key is you just got to stay the course. How'd you do it? Um, and I, I want to be real open. You know, I always think I can be real open with you, Gordy, especially in this interview. But I will tell you how I did it. Um, my philosophy, you know, you don't, you don't know you have a philosophy until you stick with it when things are going bad. A lot of prayer, you know. I'm a, a, I'm a Christian, and I a lot of prayer about it, and uh, a lot of the people I work with. You know, Western's a great place. You know, everything in life to me is is not about buildings; it's about relationships. And I thought the the people at Western is a great place. I just think we had to stick, stay the course, get a lot of people involved, and get some better players. How was it getting players to come here? Western Hall is not exactly the fashion plate, though. We have a nice locker room these days. I understand. Yeah. Well, we brought them at night. <laughs> no, I got him out by morning. No, here, here's the situation. You know, Western Hall is is not a great recruiting piece. Let's be honest about it, Gordy. Right. Um, and kids are very visual. You know, you and I didn't grow up in that era, but we know that. But I, but I do think it's great on game night, and I think they have tried to improve. You know, I think everybody in athletics, the locker room is nice. It's very nice. Um, and I think Western has a a niche. It's 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 got a really nice feel to the campus, you know. And I, I really believe that. And you know that better. You've been here longer than anyone. <laughs> you know, you're older than anyone. But uh, but I think it's got that niche, Gordy. And I think what we sold was, you know, you can be a part of something special. Because I told my players then, and I tell them now, the hardest thing to ever do is turn around Western Illinois basketball because we had no tradition and we hadn't had. And I think all those things. Are, are what we sell, and we sell relationships. To me, life, the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the quality of your relationships, and we told them that. Wow. And it's, what's the, what I found so exciting was that we just, we didn't have crowds, and we didn't have crowds, and we didn't have crowds, and I know it was embarrassing for everybody. And uh, I was in Florida for most of the winter, but boy, I would call back here, and I would hear that the, the, the crowds had doubled, they opened up the upstairs. I mean, we actually got people to come back to Western Hall to watch WIU basketball, and that helps the team, does it not? Right, and you sent me, you know, you kept telling me in your notes that if, you know, if you stick with it, they'll come back. You know, and a, a, some people have given me that message, and I appreciated that. Um, yeah, I think so. I, here's what I think. I, I think that, um, how would I put this, that first of all, you have to have something they can be a proud of. You know, secondly, I think I don't view our basketball program as an island. I think that's a problem with some athletic programs, not here, but in, in different schools. We're just another part of a great university. And I think when, it, you know, you reach out and people see that you're proud of that, I think they've, you know, there's a connection there. And I think that's what really happened. But what you said is true. And I will tell you this, you can't have a successful basketball program if you don't have a home court advantage. I know, I, I sent those notes for a reason. I had a selfish reason. I, I wanted you to know that I do have still four years of eligibility. Right. Right. You know, you know, I think, Gordy, I've seen you jog. You're really athletic. And, and uh, so that you, you have crossed my mind. And we might be contacting you uh, in the future. So, uh, Billy Wright this morning asked me, he said, can you, can you assume the defensive position? And I looked at him kind of like Brad Boehner, I'm sure, wouldn't went, what are you talking about? You can't, you can't shoot if you're in the defensive yeah. position. Well, you're probably like Brad. You're, you're probably more athletic. Your athletic ability is probably deceiving. Yeah. You know, He's so. got a little bit more of a vertical jump than I did, and he actually scored some points. Hey, you're born uh, December 27th, 1954 in Chicago. Right. Parents moved you right out to Glen Ellen, beautiful right. suburb of you're Chicago. Right. Love Glen Ellen. I mean, I'm a city guy. That was probably my first adjustment here. You know, Gary, if you look at my coaching career, um, I spent 11 years at DePaul, okay, started when I was in law school. Then from there, I went to Northern Illinois, which is DeKalb, kind of a suburb of Chicago. Then to Bradley, and I think Bradley is in Peoria, and I love Bradley. 
But I'll say Peoria is one of those things that's rare because actually the product's better than the marketing. Most things, the marketing's better than the yeah. product. You know, people don't have a great perception of Peoria, but that's a city atmosphere. Spent some years in Minneapolis, which is a great city. And then really, you know, a year in Muncie kind of prepared me for this, and then coming to Macomb. You know, so I mean, so I love Glen Ellen, I love Chicago. Um, and so sometimes I miss that city environment. Your mom, uh, your mom Julie, who was a stay-at-home mom, um, and your dad, uh, Richard, who ran a currency exchange. Right. Yeah. It's scary to run a currency yeah, my exchange. My mom, anyway. it's so interesting because there's four children in my family, but I think I had the number one position, and I tell my brother and two sisters that. I think she was one of these Irish ladies who, uh, she loved that her son got on TV once in a while. You know how the Irish are. But um, I remember one night, even later, because uh, my dad, Alzheimer's, Gordy, that going to, uh, she lived in Lombard in an assisted living, and I came, I used to stay with her. I saved Western a lot of money, Gordy. I hope, you know, I hope Dr. Thomas and Goldfarb appreciate that. But, um, and she literally had the trans, she was asleep in her transistor radio, was laying on her stomach with ESPN, and she used to follow our scores, not watch on TV, sure. uh, just on the scroll at the oh. bottom. So I, I was really sorry she missed this year. What, uh, what life lessons did you learn from your mom and dad? Um, I think, you know, they're different. You know, I think my mom really taught me about the value of family. I mean, she would only struggle if she thought her, her children were not getting along. She really put pressure on to stay in contact. Um, and she was aggressive. You know, I think she grew up, she was a fighter. So I think that, you know, I think my dad, one thing I really appreciated about my dad was that, um, you know, parents don't see their kids ob objectively. No one, I don't. We see them subjectively. And I also say this, you know, most parents, and you're, you're a parent, you have a great family, we're only as happy as our unhappiest child. You know, and my dad was different. My dad, when he went to a game, it wasn't focused about me. It was really about the team. You know, he had that view. Maybe it's because he didn't play a lot of sports, but it was always about that. And I never heard him say one bad thing about any other parent, any of my teammates. Wow. And it was just, I think I took that from him, and, and that's influenced me some. I haven't done that 100% of the time. And uh, so I, I learned that about my dad. I've heard that before, too, that we're only as happy as our unhappiest child. And, and boy, does Isn't that, that true, uh, though? Absolutely. Well, in, my, in our case, it certainly is, sure. Here's so the other thing that he taught sure. me. He taught me that always eat in a restaurant that ends in a ball. <laughs> is that, so, is that that's an Italian thing? So, so I took that, yeah. So I'm half <laughs> Italian, half Irish. There you go. Uh, so you got, if there's four, four uh, Molinari children, uh, Jan's the oldest. She, went to, she yeah. went to Illinois, and where is she these days? You know, Jan's a, Jan is, was Phi Beta Cap at Illinois. Wow. You know, and she was, and I'm not really bad, I'm just telling you who they are, but she stayed at home with her kids, and she started this consulting business where she teaches time management, public speaking. It drives me crazy. We go to a restaurant, and she'll, you know, she'll say to the waitress, oh, Susan, you know, like, come on, Jan. <laughs> so, but, so she used her skills. But now she travels all over the world. She works for McDonald's. Uh, you know, she works for different major corporations and, and travels and teaches. And Bill, Bill went to Illinois? Yeah, Bill, Bill is a coach. Bill's an interesting story. Uh, he's probably my closest friend in life. He's my closest critic and also my support system. And uh, Bill went to Illinois Wesleyan. Okay, but he got his graduate work done at Illinois. And uh, he was actually in coaching. He worked for Lou Hudson as the graduate assistant um, for two years. And then Lou, he wanted to stay there, wanted to be a coach. And Coach Hudson said, well, Bill, we don't have a spot. Why don't you use your MBA? So Bill went and worked for a firm named Van Campen and actually became the president of Van Campen. And Where is he today? He's in, uh, he's in St. Charles. And what he does is he retired, went through four buyouts. And uh, so he... It's great. He still gives me an allowance, but but I think now he does work for this man named James McDonald, who is, has a huge church up there called Harvest, and he helps recruit pastors there. And you're third, I'm in the third. Birth order. and then uh, Sister uh, uh, Diane run, uh, brings up the rear, and she yeah. went to Illinois as well. Diane went to Illinois, then got her MBA from the University of Chicago, and uh, she is the CFO. She worked for, for years for Sam Zell. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So for years. And now she's the CFO of a place called Prestige Properties, which is, uh, you know, has a lot of great uh, holdings all over, hotels all over the world. So your, your parents are proud of their, of their children and their education and their accomplishments, obviously. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, it's... And Were you guys I, close growing up? 
Yeah, grew up very middle class, though. I mean, very, very middle class. And I think, um, but, I, you know, I just think they invested. You know, our, our most important asset I've learned even as a parent, you probably know this, or in any situation, is not our money, it's our time. That's our most valuable asset. I tell our team that all the time. It's got to be tough for you as a coach. You, you, had know, to, you had to be gone a lot. Right, but my parents gave me all their time. But I, I think I've really been able to balance that. The Lord's blessed me with that, that uh, with jobs where I could stay involved with my, my kids. Four kids, let's talk about them. You got one graduating from, uh, from Western. Right. And you know, th you know why I love Western? Because my, and maybe this happened to your kid, my kids love Western. And that's the greatest kids testimony. Were, my kids were raised here. <laughs> yeah. But not only that, but I mean the greatest testimony of Western. And Mark uh, is going to graduate in May in hospitality. And tell me where he's going to work. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> how about this? The Peninsula Corporation. I mean, hello. Yeah, you know. in Chicago, which first it's great he's going to Chicago, but even, you know, if, you, even if you get the employee rate, it's going to be $400 a night, Coach. No, I can't get it. <laughs> I can't ever stay there. And he, he almost <laughs> went with Four Seasons to uh, Jackson Hole. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. that was he had an great, offer from there. Him. But what's, that says a lot about the program here, right? But what's, what's Mark's secret? He must is a great personality. Uh, I mean, he's a couple he's of He's personable. Wow. He understands the value relationships. But you know what? I give him credit because, you know, I say maturity and chronology are not the same things. Everybody matures at a different time. And he matured a little later. You know, I remember once at Western, I was looking for him for two days. I don't know what happened to him. But his junior and senior years, those people stuck with him. And now he's worked. He ran the wind gate in the summer. I mean, the front desk, all that in Peoria. And so now he, what came out of it is a great job. How about Billy? Billy. Poor I, injury. I love Billy. Wretched him his first year. Broke his foot first game, second year. And then at Michigan, and this, he, uh, the fourth game, actually played okay that game. Um, and Billy, uh, just an interesting young man. And when he tore his ACL, I will tell you, Gordy, that pulled our team together because of all the injuries last year. And they saw Billy go down. Everybody was crying in the locker room. But here's the thing about Billy. I think Billy will find a way to contribute. He's an outstanding student, loves the business program. And Billy, of all my kids, has the strongest faith. I remember he sent me a text after losing 12 in a row that basically said, you know, Dad, um, someone who walks with the Lord can face opposition with great courage and he's that type of young man and I just really think that he'll contribute he's going to be a 24 year old freshman but if he gets hurt next year I'm going to take him to the field and shoot him he was an, he was an outstanding high school player <laughs> yeah Peoria Christian lost Emmanuel by two still remember that game and you know who repped the game Jude Kaya go away yeah and I didn't handle Aren't it very you? well with Jude <laughs> I'll be honest I gotta apologize publicly to Jude um <laughs> But it was, they lost in overtime. I'll never forget this game. Oh and my. the unhappiest kid thing. Yeah. But, you know, since then, I've yeah. built a good relationship with Jude, and I know he does, great a, great, guy. does a great job at great Western. Guy. Great guy. Hey, you, you talked about Michigan. Uh, the RPI. What the heck is the RPI? Because we had the second best turnaround in the nation this year yeah. under your leadership. Uh, well, I think our players did that. Here, here's the situation RPI is they combine your record, the strength of your schedule, and all that, and they, they come to a number. They use it in the NCAA. Uh, and all those different things. Uh, and, but we, and we moved up. We're, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're pretty high. That's why our record is not as impressive as our RPI and how we finished. Because, yeah. but you know what? Here's what Western Illinois, and I give the players credit, and they need to understand this. They put Western Illinois basketball back on the map. Surely in the days of you early and Brad Boehner and all those players, yes, and some of Mark and Thaler's teams, but we've been off the radar for a long yeah. time. You would not believe in recruiting last weekend how many coaches came up to me and said, I watched the championship game, you know, even though we lost a close one, boy, and talked about it. And, and that's, that's where we want to stay. So playing Michigan and losing by two, and we should have won it, the referee had some referee yeah. issues, is better than beating Culver Stockton? From the it is, but it's a balance. Because here's the situation, you know, we play these games that are called guarantee games. You know, there's the haves and the have-nots. And I'm not going to, but when I was at Minnesota, I was scheduled. We bought six teams. In other words, what, I, what I'm telling people is they'll come play you and then never return the game. Sure. So we play a couple of those. Tim's done a great job. We don't overplay this. You know, he understands. And I think football plays one. So, yeah, I think it's good. But you got to balance those because 95% of those games are going to be won by the home team. I tell people those are the games the referee points Michigan way and says it's our ball. <laughs> yeah. How about so? So how, talk about these two games. You were on TV twice in a, twice in a week. I mean, and I was in I was in Florida. 
I go to bed at 9 o'clock at night. I stayed up right. to watch that South Dakota State game. Fabulous. But I know I know people were watching it because I got calls from all over the country, people saying, are you watching it? Are you watching it? And that's the whole deal. What does that do for us? I think an athletic program is the front porch to a, to a university. I mean, in other words, I think the one thing we can give is name recognition more than anything. And there's a lot of – and you recruit a lot of these alumni – and because you worked so hard at it over the years, and I'm sure Brad does that, and Amy does that now, but here's the deal, when they, it's great, they come out of the woodwork when they see, because they're proud of Western when they see it. And I think, I think that's, that was the value of that. You know, I think being on national TV uh, Twice, was great. Twice, you played Oregon yeah. State a week later. Now the Oregon State game, the unfortunate thing about that, that's another story, uh, we didn't play as well, but still being on national TV, and, that, and that's what we want to do. We want to point to Western, you know, I mean, you know, I've talked to Dr. Thomas about this. Western's a great place. It just got, we got to get our message out even more and more. How tough a loss was South Dakota State? Oh, it's brutal. It was brutal. I was proud of our players. You know, I mean, we, I, don't think, I don't think you ever know. Well, here's what I'd say. You know how much you value something by how much you hurt over it. So it hurts always in direct correlation to how much you value something. What would you tell the kids in the locker room after the game? I never tell them much after because they don't really want to hear it. And even in a regular season game, I don't tell them if we had a bad loss, they played bad, or a good loss, they played well. Because the film, you know, it's never as bad or as good. But I just, you know, thanked them. We all say a closing prayer. But here's what happened. Okay, we go back to the hotel. Nobody said a word at dinner. Then we bus back the next day. And I, and I don't think anybody said anything for the, it's an eight-hour bus trip for the first five hours. We did stop and get something to eat. But it was great when we got back or they'd organized that little reception. We talked about Mark, talked about Billy. David's at uh, Wesleyan. Yeah. Another, a great school. Yeah. And uh, he's play, he played some ball. He's yeah. playing some he ball. He had a there. concussion this year out five or six weeks. But His kids are injury prone, coach. Huh? Absolutely. And then you got, I got to ask, is, uh, is, Joyce, is Joyce spoiled? I mean, you got the daughter oh, last, huh? She's at Macomb High. Joy. Plays volleyball. Joy, this is a memorable day we're doing this. It's her birthday, her oh, 17th birthday, birthday, and doing this. And she's taking the AC too, so I'm sure that's memorable. Ooh, but. Um, Can, is she allowed Joy, to have Joy has so much protection from her brother. <laughs> I was going to say, does she ever? But, you know, I've been I've been always open. You know, I've been a single parent here for a couple of years, and I, it, it's hard to balance that. But these years I've had with Joy, you know, I'll value the rest of my life. Good, wonderful. So, did she ever have a chance to have a date with three brothers? Uh, you know, <laughs> you said I, I don't know, but I, I, they do analyze it. You know, okay. they analyze it, but. I think the thing that, you know, all our kids are different. They all have strengths and weakness. But why Joy can make the adjustment so well in Macomb is she has a huge people quotient. Oh, good. You know, she really adapts well and loves people. And the people of Macomb and Macomb High School and um, Abe Bartlett, they've all been going to Joy. All right, this is going to be easy. Let's talk about Glenbard, Glenbard West. You go to the, you're a hilltopper. So right. are you, you and Kathy Early. Kathy so, Early. And I've I never seen Kathy at the press conference. And I never put two and two together. You know, it was great seeing that. And I said, Kathy, then I got to know her. Is there anything she doesn't have her name no. on? No, I was looking at the commodes. I thought her name would be Kath State dump, Farm. So is it the dump on the hump or the castle on the hill? Castle on the hill. Yeah, castle on the hill. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to the good school, though. Hinsdale Central, right? Absolutely. So you're, you're, I dated uh, a girl once from Hinsdale. You did? She dumped me, too. Well, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> hey, but talk, about, talk about your trigonometry teacher in high school. Who was that? The best dressed. Yeah. And you can relate to this. <laughs> Absolutely. The best dressed teacher probably I've still ever seen Roger Miller what a what a his wardrobe cost more than my house what a wonderful person though yes you know and, and I have to say this publicly for the first time I know that he gave me a a break in trade because I had a hard time I'm not a math guy but but you know I got to know Roger and even after that I would, he would I'd go over his house something I just what a, what a special human being. Played football here for four yeah. years, did a great job yeah. there. He was president of the Alumni Council for four years. He went on to uh, a stellar career at Hinsdale where he was principal and then superintendent. I mean, Roger Miller is a stand-up guy. He did an awful lot for Western Illinois University and, 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 and Hinsdale. Great, well, great guy. Well, you know, leaders have a presence. That's yes. what I was saying. Roger has sure a did. huge presence. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Great man. Great man. Hey, so you uh, end up leaving there and you go to, uh, you, you have a good career. You average 17, 18 points a yeah. game at Glenbard West and uh, you're uh, you catch the eye of the coach at uh, Kansas State. Yeah, uh, right. who's that? Hart. Uh, well, it, was Hart the, it was his assistant who probably didn't keep his job after he signed me. But, but Hart, Jack Hartman. Jack Hart Hartman. So off you go to K State. You're there for a couple of years. You play with Lon Kruger. Yeah. And yeah. you guys are our friends to yeah. this day. Yeah. You know, I think Gordy, when you leave a place, what you leave with, um, besides a degree, and I understand all those things, is memories and relationships. 
And I think uh, Lonnie, I came in, he was a senior when I was a freshman. I stayed, you know, he lived in Silver Lake, Kansas. He was the best athlete I've ever been around. He was a drafted baseball, played AAA baseball, big, at that time, big A player here in basketball, and actually a great quarterback in high school drafted, I mean, that was recruiting football. So to this day, um, you know, he's been a mentor to me. He's been a great friend to me. You know, I'll give you a story on it real quick. When I got married, he came over like that morning and went with the tuck store and made sure that everything fit. I mean, he's always kind of looked after me. I think he lost a brother about my age, so I think he, I kind of took that role. And you guys are in each other's weddings. Yeah, we were. And in he, fact, he wore my sport coat the night they retired his uh, number at uh, his high school. And he's at uh, Oklahoma? He's in Oklahoma. He's had a great career. He's at Illinois, though, you know. So you're, so you're honest. You said, uh, hey, I left, uh, left K-State because you weren't playing enough. Yeah, no, I would. Yeah, I w it was a stretch. So off the Illinois, I, well, off my the brother Illinois, was Wesleyan. Off the Illinois Wesleyan, where you played with Jack Sigma. Yeah, and that we knew we were going to be good. Going yeah, you were good. You're great. Yeah, we went to the NAI tournament. It was great for me. I could miss like three shots, and then I'd throw it to Jack and Meek. He'd make a shot, and I'd wave my fist like I'm a playmaker. And he had a great, uh, great uh, NBA career. Right. And you know why Jack went? He picked Wesleyan over Illinois. I give credit to my college coach, who's also been an influence, Dennis Bridges, because he could sit across the table. And I think we have to get this way about Western and believe, why would you ever go to Illinois over Illinois Wesleyan? Wow. You've got to believe in your product that much. All right, so then it's off to uh, Chicago. You, you graduate from Wesleyan and you go to law school. Yeah. Uh, pick DePaul and, and you have your law degree, pass the bar, but you're at, uh, you're at DePaul and, and Ray Meyer, right. you, you catch Ray Meyer's right. eye. Talk about Ray Meyer and Joey Meyer yeah. and, and your time. Uh, well, they you guys like, went to the NCAA nine times while you were there. Yeah, they were under, first of all, I didn't know what I wanted to do at Wesleyan, so I go to DePaul, and I'd gone to Ray Meyer's camps. And if you survived his camp, it was in the wilderness, no indoor courts. So I knew Ray and Joey. And uh, so got into DePaul like I was on a waiting list. I didn't know what I would do. Got in that summer, did that, and I helped volunteer first year, okay? Then my second year, we went to the Final Four. I was a part-time assistant. That's where we went to Utah. And the Final Four that year had Magic Bird, Larry, I mean, I mean, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and DePaul. We lost by two, and then look, and that was that. the last third place game. And then, uh, so we had great notoriety then at DePaul, and what happened was they said, well, we're going to give you another full-time assistant. So he asked me if I wanted it, and oh. I said, well, I, I had to finish law school. I said, I want to finish law school. But you know how old people are really adverse to change? And I think he just said, look at do both. <laughs> so I did both. Wow. And then you, I just stayed, then, then. I stayed, then I stayed in coaching. But you uh, t talk a little bit about uh, Ray Meyer. Was he, a, was he a gentleman? Oh, yeah. You know, Coach Ray was a, he was a competitor. You know, like our huddles would go, Terry coming, shoot. You know, he didn't break it down. Great competitor. Um, good family guy. Got a lot of, see, I was around when he got all his notoriety. Early struggle in his career. I mean, I was there 11 years. We went to 10 NCAs, three Final 16s, the Final Four in the 11th year, the final game of the NIT. We were America's team. Remember, we were on oh, WGN. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we were anywhere we went. But uh, I think he taught me the value of just really competing and caring. Um, yeah, he, he, was a, he was a good man. How about Joey? Totally different in the terms of, well, Ray was an extrovert. Joey was an introvert. Just talked to Joey the other day. Um, uh, great teacher. What's he doing? Six good years. You know, it's really interesting. Joey's had a successful career in the MBDL. You know that, and that's what he's done. You know, it was hard, I think, when Joey lost his job at DePaul. Um, but, I, but, he, but he's done well, and uh, his son works for the Bulls. Now, uh, when you were at DePaul, you had an arm's length uh, relationship in law school with Kirk Dillard. Yes. You guys were there I at know the same of him. Time. He's done a lot better than I did. But uh, I loved law school. I mean, it was interesting. Um, doing both, going downtown. Kirk, Kirk is one of those guys that's more real than right. And you can't say that much about politicians. You know, he's right a lot, but he values being real more than that. And I really appreciate that about him. Even when you meet him, he's got a humility about him oh, that yeah. is so refreshing, isn't it? He was just involved. Uh, he just sent me a, blo uh, a blog. He was uh, in Springfield. They had the 63 Loyola Ramblers. Really? And he's trying to get uh, George Ireland into the uh, yes. Naismith Hall of Fame. Is he really? So they had a bunch of the players down there. Because I remember in 63. How George Ireland? Oh, I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe he's deceased, but he's still trying to get him, get him and the team in. So The only thing I'll say about my one, one story about law school, I was in my second year taking tax, which was unbelievable. 
So these are anonymous grades, but I knew the tax teacher was a huge Paul, And so I really struggled. So at the bottom of the test, I put, do you need Georgetown tickets? <laughs> Which probably wasn't the right thing yeah, to do. You never know. But you know, after that, I actually worked for a law firm for a while called Baker and McKenzie yeah. in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Big law firm and kind of learned about those those situations, but so I thought I could never get this position of coach. Guys that got recruited while you were there, Mark Aguirre, Aguirre yeah. uh, Dallas Comingees, Terry Cummings, Rod Strickland, these are some, some, yeah. some top players. No, we were recruited players. pros. Yeah, those, those we, were great and great You know what, we could get it in any way. It was a great experience for me, you know why? Because Joey was named the successor, so Joey would never leave campus much at the end. So I was just out there, uh, just got it, got thrown in the fire. That's how coach was. Okay, Mo, call me Mo. Go take. I don't think he knew my last name. Go, uh, <laughs> go take that, take that basket. You know, and I'm I'm working with these guys. You know, and I'll tell you another one. Uh, Tyrone Corbin, Tyrone Corbin, the coach of the Utah Jazz. You know, and I'll never forget going to South Carolina, in Columbia. And I had a camel hair coat on, and he goes, "Coach, isn't aren't you a little hot?" I said, "A little hot," but it, but he came to DePaul, turned it. You know, had a great career. And now it's coaching there. Then it's off to Northern, yes. DeKalb. You become a Husky, yes. and they're a, they're a dismal program. And you turn them around. And well, you guys, uh, turn, the, the second yeah, well, you go seventeen eleven, then you go you win twenty five, and you become Coach of the Year in the Mid Continent in nineteen ninety one. Yeah. Uh, how'd you like your time in DeKalb? Well, first of all, it was a natural. Okay. Secondly, the uh, Gerald O'Dell, who was my AD, was a good guy, but. He, uh, I think he interviewed me the six times, different places. The sixth time I said to him, okay, Gerald, I wear jockey. I just wanted you. He didn't think that was funny. I thought that was pretty good. But so I went there. I was blessed to have good players. They probably shouldn't have fired the previous coach. They should have given more time. All I, they were all Chicago young men. I remember our first, and it was a different time, my first uh, meeting, like four of them showed up. We led the nation in earrings. Um, you know, we were an undisciplined <laughs> group, but they were good. So that we won 17, theory. and then the second year we won 25. But yeah. here's the here's the here's the deal that no one remembers. We were an at-large team, right, from the mid-continent. Green Bay, this team that won, who is another mentor of mine that I still take touch with, Dick Bennett. But the interesting thing about that, Gordy, was, and it was so much fun, was that uh, I'll never forget sitting in the Holiday Inn in DeKalb waiting for um, that bid. And I tell my players this, this is kind of, you know, I haven't always treated everyone right, but there was a man who was the AD at, named Tom Ferricks at Dayton, and he told me he was going to interview him for the Dayton job years before, and then never followed up. So he was so embarrassed when he called me, and I said, well, Tom, I understand, you know, and I tried, and he would not take, nor he was the head of the chairman of the NCAA selection committee. So he never took Northern <laughs> off the board, and he put oh, us good. in the NCAA tournament. Oh, great. So you're there for two years, and, and the Bradley Braves yeah. called, so it's off to Peoria. Yeah. This is big time. All of a sudden, Jim Molinari is a, is a name, and you're, you're right there with Krzyzewski. And, yeah, and the yeah, right, not, uh, not there, but... Uh, you're there. You're, you're, you're a name. But People I was, know I who was, you are. How would they say on Twitter? I was upward trending. You, you certainly were. So you have... Uh, how many years were you at uh, Bradley? Eleven. Some people think longer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Bradley was another situation of... It was a natural. Bradley has great interest. And really, I think your best season becomes the standard. So it, I don't know what else we could have done at Northern. So I went to Bradley, another program that, uh, and I'll tell you, we won our first four. So I'm saying, I'm pretty good at this. My first year at Bradley. And the Lord humbled me quick because after that, we went three and 23. You went seven and 23 for the season. Yeah, so we went and three and 23. Saying, wow. Oh, Ouch. No, it was, it was. Uh, Were you worried? Uh, well, no, not in, the, not in the first year because I knew. But, uh, but you know, and I had a great AD there, Ron Ferguson, who was a coach who, yeah. at Thornridge. Yeah, Thornridge. So he, so he understood. He but, understood basketball. But concerned, but not worried. Do you have fun while you were there? Oh, I love, I love Peoria. I told you this. I think Peoria is one of those places where the uh, product's better in marketing. And in life, most of the times, it's out. I think I had a great experience in Peoria, Nine, ten thousand 10,000 fans. So the first two years, first three years, I don't know, I think maybe two or three lost 20 in the the next five, we won 20. So that's how it worked. While you were there, you ran into your most coachable player. Anthony Parker. I remember no, sitting no next No, most coachable player. He's oh, your best yeah. player. Oh, no, yeah. You got these out of oh, seat. yeah, sorry. Yeah, Billy think. Wright. Billy Wright. Talk Billy Wright. Well, and here's the thing about Billy Wright. Billy Wright, you know, Monica's wife works in the Macomb School District. Uh, Billy, the greatest compliment is, Billy, I don't remember anything about your career other than, you know, some of your accomplishments. 
the problem. He's always mature, great leader. He'll be a, he'll be a great head coach in college someday. So he's, helped, he's got to be a tremendous asset to you here. Well, I think here's his asset, you know, that he really gives me is, you know, because people question everything. That's just the nature of what we do in life. But he's seen our philosophy and our system work and never wavered. So I think he can communicate that to players. Hang in there. You know, it's worked for me in life and it's worked for basketball teams. What kind of crowds were you getting in the Civic Center? Good. I think the last year, you know, like I, mean, I said. Have ten, would you have 10,000 in there? Yeah. You know, but it, it all depends. On Saturday nights, you'd, but if you play in the middle of the week, probably about 85, 9. How much pressure does that put on you when you're, or, is oh, that, or does, that get your adrenaline, does that get your adrenaline going? Coaching's probably, you know, Bradley, I called Bradley the land of, they didn't like this in the pre-order and start. It's the land of coaches. Everybody thinks they can coach, but. The <laughs> land of, I like that. The land of coaches, oh, everybody can coach. Yeah. But, but it was, no, it was great. It, you know, that's the big thing about Western. No matter what you do in life, especially when a basketball program, you're going to work really hard, but it's great when there's interest. Who are some of your better players? Uh, I think Billy was one. Um, I had Danny Granger for a year. When I left, he left, who's at the Pacers. And then Anthony Parker was probably the best player we ever recruited. He's still playing in the NBA. Anthony Parker, probably your best player, correct, you said? Right. Anthony Parker says about you, and he went on, he said he's, he's still playing with Cleveland Cavaliers, right? Still playing. He said, and I quote, Coach Molinari is a big reason for the success I have had on the court. However, the lessons I took from him off the court have shown to be far more important. That's a pretty strong tribute. Pretty no, high thanks. Tribute. Well, I think that's what we're about. You know, I remember I scouted in the NBA for a couple of years, and uh, it was really interesting. One of the guys I scouted for was a guy named Glenn Grunwald. Do you remember him? He's yes, sliding. Sir. Oh, yeah. I scouted one year for Toronto and a couple of years for Miami. And one of the things he said to me at the end of uh, the first year we were watching – a tournament, maybe ACC tournament. He says, "What have you learned about scouting in the NBA?" And I, I started to say, "Well, you got to be athletic." And, and he says, "Here's what you should learn: It's almost impossible to make the NBA." And I think that impacted me because even here, you know, I just think my, I'm all about options. You know, play in a great school like Western, enjoy the experience, but just remember, it's not basketball is not going to be your life. So that's what we do. You take Bradley from the pits to the top. You have one bad season, they let you go. What stayed, was, I stayed too long. What was that all about? Because I could have gone to North Carolina State, Oregon State, and here's what happened. Ant, those were right before Anthony became a senior, you know. And I think loyalty is kind of one way sometimes, but here's the deal. Anthony breaks his foot and misses the first half of the season, so we win 17. Uh -huh. And then, I, then probably what happened was I overstayed. You know, co uh, basketball coaching is entertainment. And even if your entertainment's good, after a while people want different entertainment, especially at a place like Peoria. What was it like? It was, um, you better not have all your security and significance in what you do. So, and I've never have had that. But it was, it, you're kind of out there because, here's what I tell, to me, self-esteem is about being connected. You know, if you're connected to something where you're giving to a group and getting from a group, then you can have self-esteem. When you're out there and you're not connected, I think it really affects your self-esteem. You're one of the premier defensive coaches in the nation. That's what I do. I don't know if I'm premier, but that's, you're, what, you're, I, you're that's premier. what I do. You keep the opponent's numbers right. down. How's, what's that all about? You know, I think when I was at DePaul, we lost the first round of the NCAA. Now there's only 32 teams, and it ranked as number one three years in a row. And I think whatever you see in your previous job that cost you, you overcompensate when you have the chance. And I think, I thought defense cost us. Uh, so I think that's how I, and then Dick Bennett became a mentor when we played at Northern. Um, and here's what I think about defense. I think it's great life lessons for players because defense is about effort. I always tell my players, my attitude's about three things. Effort, discipline, and the ability to overcome obstacles. And defense really about effort. And the second thing is, what's good about defense is, to me, for individuals is, in life, if you can do things and not worry about the recognition, you know, I think you're way above the curve. And I think that's what defense is about. Nobody really recognized other than Ciola Clark and it twice, defense. And I think, so those two things, that's why I become. It says in your office, defense, swarm to the ball. Everybody swarm yeah. to the ball. I right. mean, uh, this is a, the real, a real mantra with you. Yeah. And, well, it's paid, how, and it's paid off. I think coaches are teachers. And how we teach is that we have three objectives on defense and three on offense. So on defense, it would be um, st simple. I think 
a, there's a genius in simplicity. Stop the ball, get the ball attack. And then we list six principles. So it would, and then I'm a big believer in dialect. You've got to get your players talking the same dialect. So the first one would be outnumber them, which is transition. Second, ball pressure. Third, constant readjustment, where you move on every pass. Fourth, defeat screens. Five, contest shots. And six, finish the war rebound. And that's how we teach it. And we do the same thing on offense, you know. And then over it, we have what I call the most important thing, I two little things. Unity, passion, excellence, all those. If you're if you're doing all these things, how'd you ever lose any games? Uh, oh no, we're gonna lose. <laughs> we lose games. I'm not saying. I'm not saying we do all the right things. My ego, you know, I never got my ego caught up, and I think uh, I understand. It's not. What do we say? It's not plays. It's players. So you have a couple of a uh, couple of years scouting. How was that? Um, it was great. I in mean, here's what I, I mean. For t- 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 Toronto and, uh, yeah, and Miami. Miami was great because I I think. I knew the general manager was from Wheaton. His name Randy Fund. And oh, oh, Randy Fund. He you know shot, Randy Fund? He shot that. He, yeah, he's from Wheaton. He, uh, they, uh, they, uh, Randy Fund or Johnny Fund? Well, Johnny's his brother. Okay, it? Johnny Fund. His, his brother is the one who's playing. They're playing against Geneva, and Geneva's got Haskell Tyson and and all of these guys back in the early '60s. And uh, Johnny Fund comes out in the first uh, first half of the sectional or something like that, and just tear, just burns up the scoreboard. And they're in the locker room, and Geneva's coach says, "Don't worry about it. He can't stay. He can't stay this hot." And he ends up scoring like 48. Really, points. in those and, days. And and the Wheat wins, and the Geneva's uh, you know is, is clearly the favorite because they've got Haskell Tyson who goes on to Duke or North Carolina wherever he goes. But it's just a great great story. So this must be his brother. Yeah, no, Randy. Randy's been Pat was Pat Riley's guy for years. Oh, okay. At the Lakers, he was an assistant coach, and then he became the general manager. But you know, here's the thing that was interesting. I'll tell you this story. That so I, I'm there, but scouting you can learn a lot. Like I really would watch coaches, and I, I learned in the NBA, and I learned anywhere. The ones that failed is where their authority didn't equal their responsibility. That's why college coaches fail. Anytime you're in a position of leadership and your authority doesn't equal your responsibility, you're, done. you're, you're not going to do it. But so I'd watch these coaches and how they interacted, because I scouted previous opponents. But I went to Minnesota as an assistant for, for three years after that. And I'm in my office one day, the year after they win the NBA champs in 2008, and I get this box. And this says a lot about the Heat. They sent me a championship ring. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and the idea, I yeah. wasn't there, but I scouted for him. fabulous is that? And, but it tells you a lot about Pat Riley that, and those guys. That, guy. That's how they do it. Talk a little bit about the pros. Talk about uh, our test the other night. What, what, what was that all about? What's, what's well, just, think, not, just uh, not thinking when we threw all that. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's so flagrant. That was, oh, yeah, and they have to deal with that. But I think, well, you know, athletics is, you know, kind of reveals. I tell our players, whether you like it or not, those people in the stands are making judgments about who you are not as a player, as a person, based on how your physical countenance and stuff. And I think, I found this, you'd probably say, there's a lot of angry people. What's, what's the secret of the Bulls? They don't, when you look at them player for player for player, they aren't, they aren't uh, all-stars. It's two it, things. It's chemistry? Team, it's team uh, Derek Rose, really respects the position of coach, very humble. You can also tell a humble person because they're very comfortable saying I was wrong. And that's how Derek Rose is, you know? Very, you know, so, and their coach, Tom Thibodeau, you know, is so sold out, great defensive coach. And they have better talent. You think they have Noah and they have Luel Dang. I really think the Bulls this year, I love the Heat. I love the Bulls. I, they're gonna, they might not win it this year, but they're going to win one. It's going to be exciting. It's exciting to watch. Uh, so you go from the Raptors. To, you spend uh, some time at Minnesota. You're head coach briefly at Minnesota. Yeah, and then it's bad. Well, you know, interim coach is not a good deal. <laughs> things that, but it's off to Ball State. How was that? Didn't have uh, much of a record. Yeah, Ball State. I was going to get out of coach, and I was going to lo- use my law degree. Sure. I had had enough. And uh, to be quite frankly, uh, I knew Billy Taylor had recruited him. He was from Aurora, and he said, "Would you help me for one year?" So that's what happened. So how'd you end up here? What happened? Uh, well, I think people hire the opposite of what they had. And I really like Derek Thomas. Nice young man. In fact, I talked to him this weekend, and he's doing great at Detroit. Good. And, but I think Derek was had never coached, you know. So I think I think uh, Tim was probably looking for someone with coaching experience, and I think he knew I had a lot of ties to Peoria and Central Illinois. And my whole career, I love Illinois. So you know, he handled it well. I mean, he called me and said, you know, you will be a candidate, and uh, I'll never forget we met in Galesburg and. Uh, 
that's how I went up here. How you like it, McCall? I like it. I will tell you when I first, to be totally blunt, the day of the press conference, um, I don't know that my excitement level was what it is now. And the reason is, I, I think in life you can either have, you have to decide you want position or impact. And you have to understand when you're with at Bradley or with Minnesota, there's 18 managers, you have all this help. And I knew at Macoma would be different. You. And well, my point is, so, and then the adjustment of a lot of things I was going through at that time. But, you know, it's like I tell our players, and I think what's happened is, what's that, what do they say in cards? You're all in. Yeah. And that's the whole deal. So I, I, I like McCone. In fact, and it's just, just because of winning, the more I've grown, I, I really appreciate it. What's your goal here? What do you want to accomplish? I want to get us to the NCAA tournament. I want us to make us a consistent program. You know, I want, I want the young men to leave here proud of um, being a part of Western and also, you know, being able to handle the life responsibilities. You got three assistant coaches. Talk about them. Well, Billy, okay, Billy Wright. So Billy's my associate head coach. He's really always been a big part of it. And then I, there was, when I was at Minnesota, they always talked about this young man named Wade Hokinson. He wasn't there, but they talked about his, his uh, attitude as a walk-on. He was a walk-on. And uh, so when it first came open here, I, 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 I heard about him, I talked to him. Wade's a real major part of the community. You know, he's, uh, his wife, Amanda, they have two children. Um, He's bright, he's got an engineering degree from Minnesota. And I'm a people person. So I knew I had to surround myself with someone who's a little more task and engineerish. So he's come and done a great job. And then last year, you know, things we talked about in the program, the biggest obstacles of the program was we only had one wood floor on campus, which is amazing. I mean, that, to me, you know, that's, now if I was running Western, I could get myself in trouble. <laughs> Those would be wood floors at the wreck, but, but um, the, uh, so that was one thing. We didn't have a full staff. So I think through my contract and through Tim's aggressiveness, that's what happened. So we we're kind of solved that. And I was looking for someone that was different, and we hired someone who was at Bradley with Jim and Les named Kyle Vogt. And, you know, so Kyle is, uh, you know, he's married. Aaron has two children, and uh, he's, uh, he's been a great addition. So the, the new floor in, in Brophy is a big help. Yeah, we really haven't, it, it got done in late January. And, uh, but I appreciate those people doing it because here's, I would tell you this, Courtney, and you understand Western better. Um, and I understand Western Illinois has to use Western Hall, but I bet we practiced 25 times outside. We would drive, practice in Monmouth. Really? Go to the Chinese restaurant. Yeah, there was no place to practice. Where are you gonna practice? The high school floor is too small, though Dave Bartlett was great. And Washington Street Gym is too small. So we'd go there, we'd go to Knox, we'd go, we'd go all over. Hey, what's going on with you and the Keys? Yeah. I hear you have a little trouble, I hear you always I said I had Wade, okay? <laughs> but uh, not as much problem anymore. I used to have a little more problem. Uh, what do they call it? Tim, I was asking Tim, I said, he said, ask him about recruiting, uh, ask him about windshield time. You just had, you just came off a heck of a weekend where you're driving, yeah. you land in Colorado, yeah. but you drive to Minneapolis, yeah, you right. drive to Kansas City. What's going on there? Well, I try to spend this athletic department money like it's our own, you know, and that's one of the challenge. But uh, I always tell him, when you're at Western, you're not in a Marriott program, you're in the frequent Frosty program. How many Wendy's could you stop at on the way? But uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's great. We travel well with our team. Uh, Tim has always given us what we need, and Nancy Sprout does a great job. Um, but you know, we we drive a lot, and especially here because it's by the time you go to Moline or go to St. Louis, it's better just having that flexibility. What's the secret of Jim Molinarian? My guess is, uh, in terms of recruiting a young man, I, my guess is once you get in the home, the parents fall in love with you and and think the world um, of you and, and think this is the kind of man I want my son to play for. Um, I, don't know. I don't know about that. I think the secret is we have something good to sell. You know, I, in places I've been is a good product. It had the obstacles, but overall, I can sell Western, great. Um, a second thing is I think that, um, and I, I, I do go back to my Christian background. I don't do things right all the time, but I do, I totally trust the Lord. And I, my approach is, the I'm control the process, not the results. So I just go in there and kind of 
sell Western, sell that. And I do think this. I, I think, um, you know, they don't, there's kind of two kinds of people, those who are, want to motivate and those who want to manipulate. And I think we've tried to really motivate people that we do have the best interest of their son. And that's, I always judge my actions. I'm going to make them say by my motives. And my motives have been to help these young men get to where they're at. So I think that we sell that. What was the low point this season? Wow, that's a great question. That's why you get paid the big bucks to be no, here. That's a, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, a, that's why you've done this show for 40 years. That's a great, the, I would say, um, what was the low point? It probably was the World Roberts loss and maybe the South Dakota State. I'm, in terms of tough South Dakota, those close losses at home uh, was About a low point. Billy going down? Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought you meant by games. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I think the thing about my son, though, is he has a great face. So I, I think there's a plan for that. Billy will be here three more years if he can stay healthy. But I think that locker room scene was low. But, but I was kind of after four, losing four starters the year before. Yeah. I was really, I mean, that's the thing we stayed healthy this year. How about high point? Wow. Um, maybe it was the IUPUI win. You were probably basking in Florida then, but uh, in the sun there. But I think that game was extraordinary when Remy hit that shot. Yeah. I think, I mean, that was a huge high point. Now, the Oral Roberts win was huge. What do you do when a referee, through no fault of his own, we won't, we won't, we won't single out Jude here, regardless of what level, uh, but what, what do you do when a referee steals a game from you? How do you handle that? That's you just, hard for me. You, the referees uh, are my cross in life because I, and this is what um, I got to watch out because when you've done something for a long time, I think you develop a quality of discernment. And you gotta, I gotta really be careful because um, you can question someone's actions, but if you ever question their intentions, you destroy that relationship. And then I tell that all the time. If I, I can question someone and why they do something, but when I question why they did it, that hits close to home. So, the, you know, referees are hard, but I am on the rules committee now. And Billy Wright laughs because whenever there's a call, I, I tell him, you know, I'm on the rules committee. Like, they don't care. You so I, I think I, I've kind of left them alone more. I haven't gotten a technical in a couple of years. Really? You, you graduate, and I find this outstanding, incredible. You graduate 90% of your players. Yeah. How? Well, well, I would think, and if you were a coach, you would think the same thing. If your players don't graduate, you know, you are, uh, then you've really used them. I really believe that. I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, this is a fantasy land, right? College sports. I tell them all the time, nobody's going to worry how many pairs of gym shoes you have. Nobody's going to worry if you go to class. No, you know, and I really think this is, if you don't leave college different than how you came, in other words, if you haven't really developed your weaknesses, we all want to do our strengths because that's what we get publicly rewarded and complimented on. And, you know, I read this. I remember Nick Saban, Dan Munson, I, the coach of Minnesota, he knew the coordinator at the Miami Dolphins when Nick Saban, Saban was there. He had this big sign as he entered the locker room. Boys do what they want to do. Men do what they're supposed to do. And to me, all a man does is take care of his responsibilities. And I tell my guys all the time, you better understand, a mistake not only costs you, a mistake later is going to cost you, if you're married, your spouse, your kids. And, and we talk all the time about this. There's only two kinds of people, those who give in and those who get it out. Which one are you? And you talk to your players about rights, about responsibilities, yeah. not rights. Yeah, because I think we're a big right-oriented society. And, you know, we're also blessed. But I, I think if you worry about your rights more than your responsibilities, in that relationship, anything's in trouble. You talk about your desire, your goal to help your players grow athletically, intellectually, socially, spiritually. That's Absolutely. pretty commendable. Well, I, I, I think that's kind of the uh, process we're in. You know, look, at, I'm here to win basketball games. I never lose sight of that. That's what I was hired to do, okay? So... And it's an end result business. But I think the way you win basketball games is basically giving them a great work ethic. You know, the Bible says our most precious possession is diligence. It all starts with effort and energy. If you don't have effort, if you don't have energy, I don't care what your gifts are. So we talk about that a lot. Academically, I tell them, you know, you go in that classroom, you wouldn't come to my practice without passion. That's that person's passion. And I really think the hard thing for people today is submission 
to authority. And I always, and I always tell them, you gain, that's another biblical principle, you gain more favor for if you submit to an unreasonable authority, you know? And, and we do, and we try to develop spiritually, here's what we do, we do voluntary devotionals, okay? Um, and, but they all come. And I think, because I, look, at they battle a lot more things than we ever battled, Gordy. Yeah. And so, so th those things are, uh, and I even tell them our, you know, the people out in Western, you know, I know that Dr. Thomas preaches once in a while. I, you know, I think, I think young people are searching. And, you know, and I think young people, um, they really understand when you're telling the truth. That's why I was telling truth telling is more important than peacemaking. And I tell them all the time, this is my other philosophy, your well-being is more important than the current comfort level of our relationship. Our relationship might not be comfortable, but if my motives are based on your well-being, then we're okay. Uh, you got four of your five starters back. You got you got uh, Ciola back. You got Obi back. Jack Holt back. Terrell Parks. But you also got Remy Roberts, Burnett coming back. Don McAvoy the third coming back. But you got a couple of uh, nice recruits that you right. can announce at this point. You win with seniors, and you know. It's been a major turnaround, but I mean, last year at this time, we had lost four players. We had lost 12 games in a row. Um, we had all those in injuries. I think there was a big cause of it, but you know, recruiting is what it's about. And, but people that know Obi and Megan o, Remy Roberts, and Terrell Parks is a dominant player. So we have our foundation blocks back. Um, you know, I think if you look at those three players, uh, have all been successful. But I also think, yeah, you got to keep recruiting. You know, recruiting is like shaving. You better do it every day. So we've signed John Schneider from Barrington, who I think will take, has to get stronger. 6'5". Yeah, 6'7", long. Length is big in basketball. And then Michael Okorobia, who really signed with at Bradley, so Kyle Vogt knew him. But he was overseas, and they didn't get the ACTs in time. He's actually an intelligent young man. Went to so, Highland Community College. So he'll be there. And, but we will sign two or three more. Great. Because we know, I told them, here's the beauty of it. You guys have put Western Illinois map, and they really have. It's unbelievable how people talk to me. You, get, you get some nice compliments. Uh, I was reading some of the stuff about you, and you've got a nice, uh, saw a nice compliment about you from uh, Mike Krzyzewski, another one from Alan Kruger, another one from Bill Self. I mean, these are, these are, these are the names. Uh, I'm just, it's, uh, it, I'm old. I've been around a long time. Those guys were all my counterparts. Who, was your, uh, who, who, were, who were the greatest college coaches you ever saw? Oh, that's a great question, too. Um, who do I think are great college? Well, I think Mike Krzyzewski is the best in a lot of ways because what happened with him was we'd go on these Nike trips. Nike takes, like, 30 coaches. So we're having success young. So they would take us, like, the Ritz-Carlton and Kawhi, and they take – now, I had to wear my Northern Illinois and Bradley shirts because they didn't know me, and they would, like, tell, give me their bags to take. And I said, I'm here, too, you know. <laughs> but I remember I, I got to know Mike Krzyzewski, and – we had a tough year at Bradley four years before I left there. And I said, you know, I, I call him, I have a question. He goes, well, come out here. But the one thing I, and this is what I learned, and this is why he's so successful. He gets this better than anyone. I started to ask him about offense and defense. He looked me right in the eye. I said, Jim, this isn't about offense and defense. This is about relationships. Let's talk about how you handle these relationships. So I would think he's a great coach. I thought Dick Bennett, in his own right, was a great yeah. coach. You know, I think Bill Self's a very good coach coach right now he you know he has an ability to connect I think John Calipari you know my one of the guys that recruited the Paul Rod Strickland said I asked him I said what makes John Calipari successful he says coach Mo he goes John coach has great players but here's the deal he never lets up on them and that's kind of you know to me college basketball provides these young men with one thing it's urgency and college basketball is the most urgent game because it's the biggest object on the smallest court with the crowd closest. Better, you know, football, sorry, Mark, and all that, you have that urgency. And I think, I think that's what life's about. You better be able to live in an urgent world. What's the best advice you ever got? Uh, well, it's funny because I've gotten a lot of good advice from a lot of, a lot of people. But I think, um, I remember I used to have to drive coach Knight. You know, Ray Meyer, I just did what, you know, Joey never did anything that he didn't want to do, so I did whatever Coach Ray. In fact, one day Coach Ray called me and said his wife Marge's car broke down. You know what I'm saying? Well, that, sorry, <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to say? He goes, well, this is her shopping day. And I go, okay. So, okay. <laughs> he said, well, she can't miss shopping. I go, do you want me to take Marge shopping? So I'm pushing the cart at Kroger in Arlington Heights for her. But, um, 
I used to drive, he had all these testimonials, you know, he was around for all those years. And uh, I would drive Coach Knight, and he would always complain. He spoke at three of them. He said, he'd call me Mullen. He goes, Mullinary, you know, I just want to tell you this. I'm, you know, I'm not doing any more of these. And, you know, he's getting on and yelling at me. I go, what do you want me to do? I asked him then. I said, let me ask you, what are the two most important things you would tell someone who wants to be a head coach? And he said, well, number one was run a lot of technical, motion offense, you know, uh, no dribble, move the four and four. I said, okay. He said, second thing, he looked me right in the eye, he said, are you worried about being liked? And, I know, and basically his message was, you know, maybe he had extremes was, you know, if you're more worried about being liked than telling someone what to do, you're not, you're not, you, can, you can't be their coach and their friend. And I think that was valuable. You know, I think I have good relationships, but usually I'm telling people what my players, what matters in five years, and they don't realize it until five years later. What advice would you give to a young kid who wants to be a coach today? Uh, don't. <laughs> uh, what would I tell them? I tell them, you know, I think a lot of people in our profession love what they can get from basketball. They love the notoriety. They love the, uh, you know, the benefits, but they don't work at their craft. So I tell them to go to a lot of clinics. I used to go every year in the spring around. Tell them to be a teacher. They're a teacher. Yeah, be a teacher. And leaders are learners. Keep learning. Keep learning. Uh, what do you do for fun? Um, okay, vices. I'll tell you one vice. Um, I love to smoke a good cigar. Okay. Especially after a win on the road. None of, nobody hangs out with me. My assistants don't like me that much. So I go, I go for these long rocks with a cigar. Um, I like golf. I'm not very good. But I like... Uh, um, what else do I like to do? I love... Um, Pretty close with your kids. Yeah, I love doing things with my, with my children. You what's, know... What's the future? For me? Yeah. Hopefully... One day at a time, right? One day at a time. Enjoy Western. Keep us improving. All right, I got to tell you this, Coach. I asked other folks to describe you. I did a little checking around on campus here, and here's how they described you. Faithful. He drips with integrity. High, high, high ethical standards. Unquestioned work ethic. Uh, and the, the last one I had was a, a class guy. Um, Pretty high praise, Coach. Uh, well, I'm not sure doing, all those things are true. Obviously doing some, some, some things right. I got to ask, the TV in your office is only a 59-inch here, and I understand there's 60-inch TVs. No, are, you, are you okay? We're going to take it back. you take it back? Absolutely. Okay. What happened? The other one broke. <laughs> so Wade Hokinson, I think they wanted a bigger TV. Jim Mullary, thank you very much for taking time from your very busy schedule this week to uh, spend some time with us here on Across the Mile. It's been a pleasure. Keep on getting those Leathernecks to, to win out there. And you folks... Uh, Thank you so very much today for uh, joining us on Across the Miles. It's been our pleasure to have the great Jim Molinari with us. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. See you around. Take care. This is a University Television production.